Well, greetings out there in YouTube land and welcome to this long overdue video featuring one of the most popular amps ever made, the mighty Silvertone 1484 Twin 12. I recently took this amp in trade along with its equally nice 2x12 speaker cabinet and thought it would be an excellent uh, video uh, feature um, because of the great popularity of these, I remember uh, when I uh, did uh, videos on the 1485 and the 1474, I got all sorts of comments and responses, and many of them uh, said that they had owned this particular amp, the 1484, which I think is more common than either uh, of the other two that I have featured. It's not perfect but it's close to it. Uh, one thing that I need is this knob right here. As you can see, it's an improper replacement. If any of you uh, out there have a nice replacement 1484 knob, let me know and I'd be glad to buy it from you. But other than that, uh, I can't find a whole lot wrong with it. So uh, here's what we can do. Uh, let's dissect it and see if it's as original as I think it is. I believe this one is exactly as it came from the factory, uh, or real close to it. Uh, and then do a really detailed audio check to see what one of these beasts actually sounded like back in the good old days, okay? This is as close to a time capsule as I think you're going to find. So if that sounds interesting, stay tuned because we're about to get started. All right, let's start our dissection with the external cabinet of the uh, amp head. And it looks just about perfect to me. We've got a little bit of wood showing through right there. But then again, who doesn't? Okay, uh, looking at the control panel, no dents. Uh, except, let's see, there's one, a tiny one right there. But that's about the straightest control panel I've ever seen. And as previously noted, this is not the right knob. I think it's a silver tone knob. It's just from a different model. Okay, so please heed my request for help in this regard. Okay, the uh, little rubber covers here, I guess to insulate you from shock, which is always refreshing, um, are still in place and in real good shape. And having done those two previous uh, big silver tone amps, I can tell you it's rather uncommon for all of this to be in place, namely because, as you know, this stashes inside the bottom rear of the speaker cabinet. And I think when it gets stashed, if this is protruding out the back end, it's very likely to get beat up. Okay, uh, but all the writing, metal condition, everything are just in a beautiful original con uh, condition. Let's turn it around. Oh wait, first let's look at the handle. God, just perfect. Uh, let's turn it around and look inside. Well, the rear view is just as nice as the front view, I have to say. Uh, this sure is different from the other two that I worked on that were like an inch deep in rat droppings. This one is in just spectacular shape and it looks to be all original, although I see cable ties back here on the reverb tank, which means somebody has opened it at some time in the past, which <laughs> is not surprising considering how lousy these sound. Somebody was probably trying to do the best they could to make it sound better and I uh, imagine their efforts were as fruitless as mine were. A uh, really nice uh, output transformer, huge power transformer. Now I'm not sure if this is the original way that the speaker cabinet connected to the head but uh, you can see that's in place and this is a two wire power cord. It is polarized but I don't believe this is the original power cord. So, at some time in the past, this must have been out of the cabinet. Uh, the power cord was replaced. I bet it was a long time ago, or otherwise they wouldn't have used a two-prong uh, uh, plug power cord. They probably would have installed a three-wire cord. And uh, somebody's been messing around here with the reverb tank. Uh, I'm going to open it up and see if they've done harm or good. Uh, we'll pull out all these really hard to get to 
screws, pull out the chassis and see if anything's been done to the innards of this jewel. Okay, as you can see it's in really really nice clean shape. That part number is significant. I think there may be two different versions of this. Okay, I will look into that in a while. I'll go in and do some research. Okay, let's uh, pull the chassis. From experience, I can tell you it's very unusual to have all four of the long uh, bolts, washers, and uh, T-nuts present, as well as the two original Phillips screws that go in right here. In this particular chassis, the screws were oriented with the uh, hexagonal head upward and the T-nut on the bottom. And I can tell you it's almost impossible to get back here in this back corner to undo that hexagonal uh, screw head. Um, every one of these that I've worked on has had the T-nuts right up here on top and then it's easy for you to access the uh, hex heads from underneath. Okay, so when I put this back together the T-nuts are going up here instead of under here. Next I'm going to look at the tube shields and these are the kind of J-lock style right here. There's two of these and one of the press down kind of interference fit. I believe this is correct for this amp chassis and that these are incorrect. Uh, so what I'll do is hunt through my stash and see if I can find two more matching tube shields to make this correct. Now how can you tell what type of a tube shield you should be using? Well uh, in this case you can see that there are one, two, and in the back three and four small protrusions at the uh, base of the shield and they fit into this little uh, extruded groove that runs around the bottom of the shield. For J-locks you can see that they have the upside down J on both sides of the shield. You will have one large protruding bump here and one at 180 degrees opposed. They then will go into the J, rotate, and lock. So in this particular case, the type we need are the ones that are marked for us, number 599, and uh, I have a nice set of three of them that I'll put in place so that the amp looks correct from the rear. And here's our set of three matching, really nice, uh, number 599 press-on tube shields. Now looking at the tubes that came with the amp, we've got original Silvertone 6FQ7s, but the 12AX7s are all Sovtech replacement tubes, as are the 606GCs. The 12AX7 nestled in the back here for the tremolo uh, is an original Silvertone tube. So, uh, two replacement 606GCs, three replacement 12AX7s. Well, I pulled the chassis out of the cabinet and it's in remarkably nice, clean condition. Those of you who remember my 1485 restoration will recall the need to use like pitchforks and, and uh, plastic explosives to get all the rat feces out of this area back here. Uh, none of that's necessary. It's all bright and shiny as is the foil on the bottom and up on the top interior of the cabinet and the cabinet is solid and doesn't rack. I think you know what that means where the top moves back and forth and the bottom stays stationary. Okay, let's uh, home in on some details here. Output transformer appears to be original, is in perfect shape. Pots look bright. The wiring's all in good shape. I don't see any evidence of molestation. The one thing, though, that does catch my eye is that cable ties are used to hold the lid here on the so-called reverb tank. And also, this wide piece here of duct tape is not correct. Uh, normally, there's just uh, these uh, narrow bands, like you can see underneath that broad piece. Um, original filter cap can. Of course, we don't know about the filter caps until we flip this jewel over. 
um, power transformer looks in great shape so let's turn it over and see what awaits us underneath well some more pleasant surprises uh, it has been recapped with the four electrolytics um, also here and I noticed that the uh, cathode bypass caps uh, were left alone I'll test them with the ESR meter but uh, since recapping has already been done over here in the power supply it would make sense to replace these with uh, modern electrolytics but then it would appear that the circuit has been pretty well updated and should be uh, ready for use um, I'm not sure why a two wire power cord was installed we all know the three wire is better so I think I'll install a three wire power cord now when I picked this amp up it was stored in a recording studio and I my understanding is it had been used there uh, for quite a few years and stored indoors maintained I guess by the whatever amp tech the studio used who did it uh, looks like a really nice job on this it's very unobtrusive and very well maintained so I think what we have here is an amp that's going to need very little um, in updating perhaps these two caps right here and uh, God only knows what the reverb is going to sound like and then with a three wire power cord um, I think uh, we'll be able to begin our audio testing I'm going to try both an SM57 and an SM58 on this uh, those of you who are familiar with the microphones to me the SM57 uh, is more directional and you aim it right at that interface between the voice coil and uh, the uh, speaker uh, cone uh, whereas the 58 is more of a, a broader and has a more diffuse uh, area uh, of, of uh, sensitivity and that might be even better for capturing the two 12 inch speakers rather than the SM57 which would only capture really a portion of one of them okay so I just want to get you excited here about the audio testing I know a lot of you owned amps just like this when you were young, the youngsters and may still own them and um, you have recollections of how they sounded well let's see if those recollections are accurate okay let me change out the two caps and the cord and then I think we'll be ready uh, to get Jack and Ollie to strum a few chords through this for us and we'll see how it sounds also of course I'm going to go through the speaker cabinet verify that the speakers are in really good shape the wirings correct the cabinets clean do a little detail work on it and then uh, our audio testing can begin all right the cathode uh, bypass caps 50 at 50 volts instead of 25 volts have been installed and the a new three wire power cord has been wired in uh, with the chassis securely grounded the three electrolytics in the can uh, 5 10 and 20 microfarad all check out perfectly with the ESR meter for all I know the can was replaced at the same time that these electrolytics were replaced so I'm gonna leave it in and uh, we'll see how the amp sounds uh, with this uh, can cap still in place now that we're through with the underside of the chassis uh, let's remove this a reverb tank that's obviously been open before and see what condition it's in inside uh, and if there's anything we can do to improve how it's going to perform and to remove the tank we first have to go uh, inside into the uh, circuit and unsolder these two wires here and the two small diameter yellow wires there so that the tank can come loose from the chassis itself and as you can see those yellow wires uh, pass through into the underside of the chassis exactly where they need to be uh, this one right here was soldered to this lug and the one over here is soldered to this lug I've already disconnected these two same thing here except that we're at a 90 degree uh, position on the uh, terminal strip and I'm going to have to solder the upper and lower one and then the tank will be uh, free to be removed from the chassis 
Okay, all four wires are loose, and uh, I noticed something here. It might have been a short. It looks like at some time or other, uh, there's been some solder here that melted through the insulation and might have melted through the insulation over here. So uh, just pulling these wires loose may have solved the problem. Uh, we'll see. Now I've turned the chassis over and I've unscrewed the two nuts that hold the uh, tank to its suspension springs here. And now we're ready to lift it out of the chassis. Now the so-called reverb tank is out here on the tabletop and while I'm the first to admit that uh, trying to repair or fine-tune a Silvertone reverb tank is uh, an exercise in futility generally, uh, let's go ahead and take off the tape and the cable ties and see what awaits us within. Well, the cable ties and all that gummy, wretched, sticky tape have been removed. I'll have to clean up the cover here with lacquer thinner before I put it back together. But now we'll sit down and look at the little piezo uh, reward tank that uh, Silvertone blessed us with. Looking here at the tank itself, it looks like all the parts are present. Everything looks pretty good except that this thread right here is loose. You see there's a tiny little cut into the masonite there and there. And on the tanks I've seen that were not molested, that thread comes through and holds the reverb spring down tightly to the masonite surface. That seems to make it work better. And it cuts down on the extraneous thrashing and, and god-awful noises that these things can generate. So I'm going to have to put that a little thread in there and hold this down. Meanwhile, let's take a look at how these tanks function. Okay, the spring's out of the way, and you can see that up here they used uh, the elegant uh, technique of applying uh, like masking tape over the copper part so that the spring itself cannot conduct. Okay, it is insulated from the piezo unit here by the uh, what looks to me like uh, masking tape both on the spring and on the little piezo chips. Okay, you can see them here. It's The little chip is held in place vertically between nothing more than just a nut here that has this wire. One of the yellow wires goes through here to the nut and the other yellow wire goes right here to that brass. Now the input and output transducers are identical. The only difference is, as is uh, very obvious by the names, that the signal will be input to this one and will be output from this one. And let's see how that happens. We see here the little steel plates like bread on either side of the piezo crystal sandwich pinched in between the copper loop there and the nut over here. Now when the music signal is uh, applied to this unit, it will develop an electrical potential. It's almost like a capacitor here, but an electrical potential will develop here in the piezo uh, crystal and make it vibrate. And it will vibrate exactly at the same frequency as the music input signal. Now that vibration is going to make the spring have a vibration. The spring is going to transmit that vibration over here to this little piezo sandwich. And when we vibrate it, it produces an electrical signal output which is identical to the music signal that was put in over here except having gone through the spring it's going to develop all sorts of delayed uh, signals, overtones and other things that we associate with what we call reverb. Okay, there is going to be a delay uh, different delays here in the signal that will be overlaid upon it and when our ears hear this we think, oh, that sounds like an echo. That sounds like reverberation. Okay, so we apply a signal here, generate 
vibration, send it down a spring. Where that vibration is altered and enhanced, then we pick up the vibration here and use the piezo crystal to generate an electrical music signal that is enhanced and altered by all sorts of delayed um, signals and uh, overtones and other things here that give us the reverb effect. Now why the silver tone reverb is generally not very good, okay, to put it brutally, uh, is that it uses these cheap little inexpensive simple piezo transducers rather than the magnetic transducers that we see in uh, fender tanks like by Acusonics and Mod. Okay, that is infinitely better. But then you need to have an output transformer, you need to have a driving tube, you need to have a recovery tube, it gets expensive and it gets elaborate. And Silvertone didn't want to do that. Plus, they don't have a whole lot of room here for that. So instead, they rely on the piezos, which are compact, inexpensive, simple, and really not all that great at what they do. Okay, so that's why we have such a compromise here and rather inferior uh, reverb effect. Now, it's tempting to uh, apply an ohmmeter to the two wires to see if there's continuity through the system and there shouldn't be simply because uh, the piezo crystal is really not a conductor okay it responds to electrical potential but it really does not conduct it so uh, you will get no electrical continuity between the two wires but what you need to worry about is does the copper loop make good electrical contact with this plate and does the nut over here make good electrical contact with this plate? So what I'm going to do with the little crystals removed is run a, a V bend here of a fine sandpaper through that gap to sort of polish and clean the surfaces of the two contacts. Then I'll reassemble the unit with the little sandwiches uh, with hopefully enhanced uh, electrical uh, conductivity with the uh, copper loop and with the nut. Now here's the unit reassembled. You can see that the insulation is intact so the spring has no electrical contact with either transducer. Um, the little piezo sandwich is vertical and engaged in the spring. The spring comes down to a V where it's tied down to the masonite board comes up engages this uh, little piezo sandwich and then connects to the uh, copper uh, vertical wall over here okay and make sure there's no binding or, or any pressure any spring tension pulling on the little piezo sandwich because they'll break they're rather brittle okay so I think this one is about ready to uh, reinstall and test and we'll keep our fingers crossed uh, let me clean up the cover here to where it's presentable and then uh, we'll put it all back together. Well, a reverb tank has been reassembled and is in as good a shape as a silver tone uh, transducer tank can be. Let's install the newly cleaned cover and then rewire it back into the uh, circuit and see if by some miracle the reverb effect has been restored. Uh, to this amplifier. Okay, the reverb tank has been uh, wired back in place and as you can see I used uh, shrink wrap to protect those uh, areas where wire was exposed on both of these particular wires. Over here everything went fine uh, so everything soldered back together. Let's see if we have any reverb now. And uh, for our audio demo I'm going to substitute a pair of uh, American-made 6L6GCs. I'm not sure who made these. I'm sure uh, tube experts out there in YouTube land will immediately spot them uh, and let us know what brand these are, but I have three to choose from, so I'm sure I can come up with a nicely matched pair. 
All right, I'm checking the bias on the new uh, American 606 GCs um, using the Eurotubes probe, and it looks like we've got about 39 milliamps at 444 plate volts. That's for the left tube. Now let's uh, test the right 6L6. And for the right hand tube, looks like we have about, what, 36.3 milliamps at 445 volts. Well, it looks like we have a reasonably good match between the two output tubes right off the bat. And uh, remember, these uh, tubes have grounded cathodes, so we bias them to 70% of max for a GC, which is 30 watts. So 21 uh, would be max. This is like 55 to 60% of max, and I feel real comfortable with that. I think we'll get great tone out of these, so I'm going to leave them as is. The work on the 1484 head has been completed. The reverb tank uh, was tuned up and has been tested, and it is not strong, but it does sound uh, tolerable, which is unusual. Um, I've replaced the three Sovtech 12AX7s with uh, vintage American-made 12AX7s, installed the uh, shields. Over here we have the two uh, replacement 6L6GCs uh, that are also American-made. Uh, I believe now that this head is ready to go in the house and uh, be uh, subjected to a fairly stringent audio test. Uh, next, I'm going to start detailing the speaker cabinet and then we'll be ready to go. I've been busily gluing down all the places where there's any loose material, uh, any little scuffs or lifted areas. Uh, you see the rear of the cabinet is in beautiful shape as is the interior. Um, now I think it'd be interesting to remove this upper uh, rear panel and take a look at the speakers. Well I removed the upper rear panel from the cabinet and as you can see it's just immaculate. Uh, so much nicer than the ones that I've worked on previously. Um, here is that uh, infamous masonite speaker baffle that's been initialed. Um, there's a number 4096, God only knows what that refers to, maybe it's a serial number. Uh, over here is probably the initials of the person who assembled this particle board cabinet. Uh, speakers are in beautiful shape. Jensen C12Qs as they should be. Uh, let's look here at the number 220 means Jensen. The 33rd week of 1966 and this one is exactly the same. So these are the original uh, pair of speakers that were put into the cabinet and it appears that it's the original wiring and that original extension cord that connects to the uh, amp head. Every speaker I've ever seen in a uh, Silvertone amp always has numbers scribbled all over it. Um, I guess uh, they are the numbers that designate what speakers go in what cabinet, but uh, I don't know what, how you can make a rhyme or reason of it because I don't see a matching number in the cabinet anywhere. But uh, that's the innards here, and they are absolutely just immaculate and beautiful. Okay, this thing looks like it's like six months old or so. It's in really nice shape. Thank heavens. Now let's reinstall that upper back door, uh, turn the cabinet around, take a quick look at the grill cloth and silver tone name tag, and then I think we're ready to start uh, with our audio testing. And as you can see, the exterior of the speaker cabinet is in really nice shape, which is rather unusual, because these things are big and bulky and get banged into corners and furniture and other things. There's a little scrape right there. We've got a little scrape right here, but the handle and the metal end pieces are just in beautiful shape. The left side over here looks great, as does the underside. All four of the feet are present, and the 
all-important Sears Silvertone nameplate. The grill cloth is super nice, other than some mysterious stains right here that should probably be uh, submitted for forensic analysis. I fear that they might be from like moist undergarments that were hurled at the uh, speaker cabinet during a performance. Hopefully they're female uh, undergarments. Um, anyway, the grill cloth looks fantastic. So that's it. Uh, I'm going to take this in the house now, reunite it with that head cabinet, hook up a uh, Shure SM57 microphone, and let's do a really uh, stringent audio uh, analysis of the amp and its speaker cabinet. I know I said earlier I'd be using an SM58 also, but uh, it just hasn't worked out. I don't know, the microphone seems to be malfunctioning, so uh, I'll get it replaced, and uh, in the future we'll also use the SM58 in our audio testing. But for now, it's the trusty old SM57. Well, it's time to open another gift from a generous viewer. We've got Jack performing his traditional cat scan in case he's over here gnawing on a catnip leaf so uh, one happy family here time to open the package and see what's inside well it looks like we have a nice cover letter here um, the box and letter come from a viewer named Steve Todd and look here on top there's a box addressed just to Jack and Ollie oh my lord look at this full of treats and toys. Let's get all this out and take a look. Well first off we've got four packs of their favorite types of kitty treats and some really cute multicolored mice. Okay, fantastic gift Steve. Thanks so much. Let's take a look now at what's in the box for their papa. And lo and behold, how about an absolutely mint pair of Jensen C12Q speakers. Date code 1965 and November. And in a beautiful job of packing, I notice that he has bolted each speaker to its own piece of cone protecting wood. Okay, this sure is better than the way Jensen themselves ship speakers. So, not only thoughtful, but also very fastidious in packing. Wow. I mean, I couldn't ask for a nicer gift than this. and so usable uh, when restoring vintage amps. Okay. Steve, you've outdone yourself. This is a fantastic gift, both to me and to the kitty cats. So, thank you from all of us. Uh, we really appreciate your generosity and thoughtfulness. Well, it looks like that SM58 microphone is going to let us down. Jack's been working on it steadily and he can't get it uh, to work properly. So, so it looks like we're going to go with the trusty SM57. Uh, and uh, we're going to play some tunes in the clean channel and then we'll go to channel 2 and then we will uh, play you some tunes uh, with the tremolo and with the reverb and also with different pickups selected with different tone adjustments and uh, generally uh, at least 12 o'clock or a little higher on the volume controls. Okay, are you ready? And then, just to be historically correct, we have a really nice vintage silver tone guitar uh, to use in our audio demonstration.
that's about it for this uh, video featuring a really nice original Silvertone 1484 uh, piggyback amp. I hope you enjoyed it uh, and I want to uh, extend my heartfelt thanks to all my Patreon patrons and PayPal contributors for keeping our channel on the air and advertising free. Uh, if you'd like to join them, uh, I'll put a link in the video description to help you to do so. Now, for a little change of pace, uh, for all you hot rod enthusiasts, uh, I'm going to uh, add a part two video here, or second feature, which will show uh, the uh, modification of the 1934 chopped and channeled coupe. Uh, from a single four barrel carburetor to three two barrel carbs. Okay, there's more work involved than you might imagine, uh, but the end results were definitely worth it, as you will see. If this sounds at all appealing, please stay tuned, and regardless, I hope to see you again in our next video. Thanks so much for watching. Bye for now. Well, greetings and welcome to today's uh, Hot Rod Extravaganza in which we're going to do the unthinkable, which is to convert the 350 Chevy engine in that chopped and channeled uh, 1934 coupe that you saw in a previous video uh, from a single uh, Edelbrock four barrel and air scoop and HEI ignition into three two-barrel carburetors, each with their own little helmet air cleaner, and a uh, replica old-fashioned distributor made by Pertronics. It's going to look just like the old original point distributor, even with a little window to lift to uh, set the dwell, but it's going to be an electronic distributor. I already have the parts on hand. Uh, and I'm going to do this in two separate steps. The first step is I'm going to replace the HEI distributor uh, with the Pertronics replacement, get it timed, get all the, the cables, uh, the coil, everything connected properly, get it running perfectly. Then I'm going to convert over to the 3-2 carburetors. That way, if anything acts up with them, I'll know it's not the distributor ignition system. It's the carburetors themselves. Uh, let's go on inside. Let me show you what the three twos look like with the adapter manifold. I think you'll get a kick out of it. I've kind of set all the parts together here on display so that while I eat dinner at the table right beside this uh, cabinet, I can drool over the carburetors. These are three Stromberg 97s uh, with their little helmet air cleaners and then a, a vintage speed uh, three into four barrel adapter intake manifold. As you can see, it's going to look pretty slick. All right, I removed the distributor cap 
uh, and in an HEI ignition. It also includes the coil that sits up here uh, on top of the distributor. And I have carefully marked the position of the base of the distributor by looking at where the vacuum advance tube is pointing. And I've also marked over here where the rotor is pointing. Okay, so uh, next step is to remove the bolt and crow foot down here that holds the distributor in place and keeps it from either lifting or rotating. And now it's time to lift it up and out of the engine. And the distributor has been lifted out. And then you see it here. The reason it has to be replaced is not only cosmetic, because this is a very modern style of distributor, and it had that bright red cap and red wires, which are kind of jarring. But also, uh, when that 3-2 manifold goes on, it's going to reach back here far enough that the large diameter of this distributor would interfere with it uh, being able to set properly on that intake manifold. Now here's the brand new Pertronics uh, old-fashioned looking distributor. You see it has the old small diameter black top and it even has the little uh, trap door here so that you'd go in with your Allen wrench to set dwell. Although there are no points in this at all, uh, it is uh, a, a magnetic triggering distributor. Also, there is no built-in coil up here in the top of the cap like there is in the HEI system, so I'm going to have to have a separate coil. But anyway, let's pull the cap, and then we'll make sure that the base uh, of the distributor goes in exactly like the HEI, in the right direction, aiming like right about there. And we'll also have to be sure that the rotor is pointing over here uh, when the distributor is properly seated in the engine. Here we have the Pertronics distributor with the cap off. You see that the rotor is conventional, just typical of Chevrolet V8s, but uh, there are no points or condenser in this. We have a magnetic trigger uh, to initiate the spark. Now looking way down in that uh, little black well there at the rear of the engine, you can see a slotted uh, steel rod well, that's what drives the oil pump. And as you can see, the slot now is sort of parallel to the firewall of the car. Yet on the distributor, for it to fit in properly, uh, that slot needs to be perpendicular to the uh, firewall of the car. So I'm going to have to reach in there with a long screwdriver and adjust the oil pump slot in its drive rod uh, to where it, it's in the proper position uh, for the distributor gear to fully mesh and set down in the engine. You can see the, the drive there for the uh, oil pump. It uh, looks like the end of a big fat screwdriver nestled down in the bottom of the gear. And now I hope you can see down in here that the slot is facing uh, perpendicular to the firewall. Maybe you can't see it, but trust me it is. Okay, the new distributor is dropped into place. You see that the vacuum advance uh, snout is pointing right here at the original mark, and the rotor is pointing over here. So it's not in perfect time. We're going to have to adjust the base in relation to the position of the rotor to um, adjust the timing to get it just right. But what you want is close enough for the car to start and idle. And I think this is close enough. Okay, so let's go ahead and put on the cap. We'll install the coil and the plug wires. Uh, and then I think we'll be ready to uh, check it, see if the car will run, and set the timing. Now just to make sure that all the ignition parts work together well, I got a Pertronics flamethrower coil to go along with that distributor. And I have mounted a uh, chrome coil bracket up here on the firewall. It's there for two reasons. Number one is you can't mount it up here because that would interfere with the 3-2 manifold. And when it's mounted on the firewall, it, it, the coil stays a lot cooler, which is better. So for two reasons, I have mounted the, the chrome uh, coil clamp up here on the firewall. Let's install the coil and then wire it up uh, and put the cap on and the spark plug wires. Distributor cap on, 
the coil is wired with the switch hot wire from the ignition and uh, the black black and red wires over here uh, to the uh, distributor. Now uh, it's time to install the spark plug wires. Well step one is finished. The a new distributor and coil have been installed with a brand new uh, set of spark plug wires. Uh, the ignition timing has been set. So now it's time to move on to the removal of the air scoop and the four barrel carburetor and then we can test fit that uh, 3-2 adapter manifold. Okay the scoop and air cleaner have been removed and now it's time to disconnect all the hoses, linkage and everything else and remove the uh, Edelbrock four barrel carburetor. Okay everything has been removed from the carburetor and including the four half inch nuts that hold it to the manifold so it's time to lift it off uh, and then we can go get that 3-2 um, adapter manifold and test fit it. And while I'm at it, i got to say that this black Pertronics distributor and coil looks so much better than that giant bright red HEI distributor. Uh, I should have installed this a long time ago. And here's the 3-2 manifold uh, installed. And as you can see, there's very little clearance back here between it and even this small distributor cap so there's no way this thing could have fit with that giant HEI distributor. Um, so there it is. It does fit. I was worried about it interfering up here but no. It sits down nice and flat. So I guess now uh, it's time to machine the manifold uh, for vacuum lines for the vacuum modulator to help the transmission shift for vacuum advance for the distributor uh, and then um, install it and then start installing the carburetors and linkage. I just couldn't resist seeing how it's going to look with the carburetors in place and I think you've got to admit that's a whole lot more impressive than just a single four barrel nestled under a kind of generic scoop. Um, I can't wait. I'm starting to get excited about this. A lot of work left to do the linkage, the fuel uh, supply, and uh, vacuum lines. Lots of work. Okay, so uh, let's quit moaning and get started.